So welcome to the talk, HDFS tiered storage, uh, mounting object stores in HDFS. Um, we are from Western Digital, from the Data Center Systems Group. I'm Thomas. Um, I run engineering product for um, our access layer, so mainly S3 API compatibility um, and Hadoop integration, of course, like S3 clients but talking to our system and Hadoop is one of the clients of our system. Um, I think I started off contributing to Hadoop in 2014, um, starting some small S3A file system improvements. Um, Steve Lochren from Hortonworks um, helped me along the way, be becoming, contributing, reviewing my stuff, um, and as you'll see, sometimes even rewriting it, improving it. Um, like the rename free committer, it's a, we've been talking about that for a while. I just before the talk, somebody came up and talked about com rename committer, help me, S3A. Um, Steve has a talk about that tomorrow, and I think we've, we've finally cracked a puzzle um, to make that happen. But today, it's not about S3A per se. S3A is, of course, still in the picture. It's about HDFS tiering, which will add S3 as a tier to HDFS. And in a prior life, I thought probability theory was a lot of fun, and I, have a, I did a PhD in, in queuing theory. Hi, and uh, I'm Ewan Higgs, and I'm a software architect at Western Digital, uh, working on Hadoop integration with um, our uh, active scale systems, which is S3 compatible storage. Um, previously, I've worked in embedded systems, uh, managing market data in the financial world, and also working in the HPC sphere, which um, is all kind of similar. Uh, lots of data needs to move really fast. So this is basically the executive summary. So the talk is structured as follows. Executive summary, then some context, and then Ewan is going to go. We have a demo, and then Ewan is going to go uh, loose on the technical details. So um, we're going to do the explanation up front so we people don't fall asleep first. So basically, what we do is we have we built an external storage tier for Hadoop. And that external storage beer can be an object store, like S3 or Azure, or it can be another HDFS system. Um, so what this allows, this allows your Hadoop applications to um, follow their trusted HDFS workflow. They still interact with HDFS. They actually don't know about this external storage tier. Um, and data tiering happens asynchronously in the background. And it's the admin who controls um, the data placement through his usual uh, HDFS CLI. Um, how is this implemented? It's by adding a new storage policy. So you can, HDFS has these storage policies, disk, SSD for, for hot data, archive uh, for the cold tier, and we're adding a layer here provided, which means that the data um, placement, so the physical bytes on storage media are outside of the cluster. Um, so this is collaborative work with uh, Microsoft, um, Chris, Chris Douglas's group, um, and they are, we together, Prior to the current work, um, we worked on the read path for the provided storage. That got merged in December, uh, hurrah. Um, and it's currently already being used um, in production at Microsoft. They're experimenting a little bit with uh, um, this CP, replacing this CP workflows uh, in Bing um, by, this, by, um, by provided storage. But um, in the San Jose event, um, we're gonna, they're going to probably give an update on, on how, that, how that's going. Just maybe a quick show of hands. Um, who was, we, we presented this read part last year, both in Munich and San Jose. Who saw one of those two talks? So only yeah, five or six people. So I'll, um, I'll go through the slow part and, and explain everything thoroughly. Okay. So we're going to front load the demonstration so you can kind of see uh, what it's doing, and then we're going to go over explaining um, what we've just shown you and the value that it should be providing uh, to users of HDFS. And then I'm going to go through the technical details. So what this demonstration is going to show is, uh, as an administrator, I want to configure HDFS with an S3A backend um, with the appropriate storage policy. Um, using the commands on the screen. Uh, and the purpose of this is that when a user copies data to the HDFS, they're going to be asynchronously copied to the synchronization endpoint. 
Now, if you come here just about the right path, you might be thinking, well, just do disk CP. But the larger scope of this is that it's, a, it's an actual storage level or storage tier within HDFS, which means that when you read it back again, you'll be able to read it still through HDFS. So it's not moved out of the way that you would need to access it from another place, but it's still available to the client from the same place. I think the, the data, the physical bytes on disk are moved, but there's, there's still a metadata entry in the name node which can get you the data streamed back into the cluster on demand. So what I'm doing here is I've uh, prepared the demo in advance to avoid raising the ire of the demo gods. And here this is using Docker Compose. Um, this uh, Docker Compose system was built by one of my colleagues, uh, Kasper Janssen. Uh, and it's, it's been reliable, but uh, who knows with the networks. Uh, so what I'm doing here is uh, running the cluster in the top, and all the logs are here. And at the bottom, I'm going to attach to a name node client. And I've got uh, four scripts with uh, helpful numbers. And in the first one, uh, what I'm going to do is make a backup directory within my HDFS system using HDFS, DFS make their of the backup. Then the next step will be to set the storage policy to use provided. And this will have a disk copy and also a provided copy uh, available on the backup path. So that's done. And now the third step is going to be able to, is going to create a sync service mount. Uh, and this will uh, be a backup only. And I've named it fake Apache logs because for this demonstration I've generated uh, some fake Apache logs. And I'm going to be backing this up onto a location of, on my S3 system called the backup bucket. So now that that's done, I copy, uh, I think it's 853 files. Uh, I talk a lot more quickly when I don't have to type it in in front of me. And so we're going to copy from the local to the uh, ba Apache backup logs, or the backup directory, sorry. So this is inside HDFS, so slash backup is the yeah. path inside HDFS. So there's going to be 853 files in total. Uh, so it's a small case. It's just on my laptop using some Docker. Now this is going to take uh, a few minutes. So instead of the nice thing about having a recorded demonstration is that I can actually speed this up. So what's happening over here is I use S3 command to see how much, how many files have made it. And as you can see, it's it's continu continually going through. We use the throttling mechanism of the heartbeat uh, system to uh, write the blocks to the S3 system. Uh, and the default that we've chosen is 10. Uh, uh, we've chosen 10, but I, I, I think that's quite uh, conservative. Uh, and in this demonstration, I even upped it to about 100, and it's still um, took some time, so that's uh, a value, a default that we're going to have, we're going to, have to tune. So if I step ahead. Is this, is this All right, so I'll, I'll use this one for now. Um, another reason why having the video is better because then I can hold the mic. So, uh, so far it's done, I skipped ahead, and now it's finally done the 853 files. And at this point, it's done copying, and the log has stopped spewing out all the debug trace to demonstrate that we've done it. And now what I do is, um, it's one thing to just copy all the files, but I, I can also delete uh, hold directories and they are updated. It's updated quite quickly because this is just a metadata operation. Um, and it's not bound by the heartbeat protocol, which takes quite some time if you have to wait for each heartbeat uh, before you can send more commands. And unfortunately, Docker wraps the text. So this is deleting the 2016 directory within my logs. And uh, qu quite quickly, it's 
quite a lot of files get removed. And then I can delete the rest of the directories and it will continue to be removed. Uh, we have support um, locally that we want to push in the coming weeks to um, the HDFS 12090 branch, which will be, it does uh, the creates, the deletes, the renames, and uh, modifiers. And um, that's uh, the, where we are in the progress. So at this point, I've deleted all of my logs. And over here, we can see that we've only got the one f uh, line left, and that's because this is actually just the top level directory in the listing. So I think that part is done. It's just there, so it's now empty. So the next part of a demonstration that we're, we're not ready to do yet is um, one thing that we really want is, uh, as an administrator, I want to be able to set the storage policy to be provided only. And this means that we would be writing all of the data to HDFS, and it would store it uh, replicated. Uh, and then it would be able to uh, asynchronously write this data back to the provided system, the external uh, sync endpoint. Um, and then uh, the name node would um, be told that these have all been replicated and uh, available on provided, and then it can uh, get rid of the uh, local blocks that are no longer required. Yeah, this is in the name node, so it's a metadata connection. It's, it's uh, synchronization, so it's not mounted as a volume. That's an important distinction that, uh, speaking with some of the colleagues, it's not, it's not mounted uh, like you would mount ext4, it's it's more like um, one of any type of data synchronization service that you would use with a cloud system on your laptop. Uh, so it m synchronizes the metadata, and in the background, it will write the data. Uh, I think here you d you define. You want to have a synchronization service from the HDFS part, var logs, to the bucket in S3, Hadoop logs. Okay, so well, this data is all available now in the S3A system. So you could, you could, or you could access it from the HDFS, or you can also access it from the bucket here. Uh, we're gonna, so we decided to front load the demonstration to get an idea of how it looks? It will be synced all the time. Yeah. So there are two things here. Here is actually the demo was when you write, you also write a file asynchronously to the to the backend to the provided storage system. And then this other slide was as an admin, retroactively I want to mo move this cold data uh, only in. I want to move it completely to the provided storage system. So can you see somewhere in the HDFS name node metadata that this mount exists? Yes, absolutely. So there's a list of commands that we don't go over in the slides. Um, I can show it to you as well. Um, but for instance, if you use HDFS sync service uh, minus list, it will show you the list of mounts. Uh, and then we also have a status command, which will give you information about how much has been synchronized at some point. Uh, I think the uh, questions we were going to move to the end. The yeah. purpose of the we'll demonstration to. was to get an idea of uh, how this all ties together, and then we're going to do um, dig into the separate bits of how it works and, and so on. Okay. Yeah. Okay, next. So basically, how did we get here? Um, maybe a quick recap of, of S3A. So you saw that we used S3A. Um, so S3A, I think it also came up in, in, in Sanjay's talk this morning. Um, so S3A, it's a Hadoop compatible file system. It has uh, the siblings, the WASB, the ADLs. Um, and so th the key point there is do you do direct I.O. between your Hadoop application and your S3 compatible store? Um, 
And so that's scalable and resilient because the name node functions are taken over by the object store. Um, I think S3A is functional sin about since Hadoop 2.7 and um, there's been a lot of ongoing improvements and I think Steve Lochran from Hortworks is really the, the driving factor there. Um, we, we had some, some small contributions there and uh, Steve helped us tremendously on, on getting them ready and reviewed and um, rewriting the ugly parts, rewriting my crappy code. Um, and so probably in S3A, we, we, we started working on it probably four years ago. Um, then people said like, why do you want to do this? And by now you see that people really have bought into this model. Um, Hortonworks Data Cloud, the Databricks guys, um, ba backing up clusters, um, archiving cold data. I think also Sanjay talked about it this morning that people really running in the cloud and having a, an ephemeral HDFS system. Um, those are really the things which also which tie in perfectly in, in our presentation today. So I think this is a familiar slide for the Hortonworks guys. They, the evolution you d they describe basically followed this. I think this slide came up two years ago and last year this slide was shown. So in, in the beginning, in 2014, people didn't want to touch the cloud. Maybe just they want to do some backup and restore of, of, uh, of their entire clusters just as a worst case scenario. And then gradually people started reading from the cloud and maybe copying the final data back to the cloud. And then they started in the end now people are using S3A and HDFS. They're managing both file systems. They're doing direct I.O. to both. Um, often using, using HDFS as a temp um, system or a hot cache because it has certain, I think that's the next slide, it has certain capabilities that these cloud stores do not have. Um, and then what we're talking about here to get today is again, we, you go back to the first, um, yeah, it, it looks very similar to the first picture, but there's no procedure here which once every n weeks or n days an admin does some complex thing, error prone thing, but just all the time asynchronously your data is decanted out to the cloud and if somebody accesses in HDFS a block which does not have any local storage, is not stored locally, the, the block is just read from the, from the cloud and paged in. Um, so here you really see that the, if people went to either yesterday the, um, the talk on, on Hadoop 3X or to mo this morning Sanjay's talk, here you really see like the, the, hot, the hot tier is in HDFS and there's a cold tier and that's where the discussion, the interesting stuff is going on. Where will this cold, cold tier be? Some people think it's the erasure encoding inside HDFS. Other people think it's going to be ozone co-located with HDFS, other people think it's an external cloud system. So that's it's really about this cold, the, the cold data for Hadoop, where is it going to be? And so I think the reason why we're interested in this is because at Western Digital, um, we also built object storage systems. So we, we, build you, we built this rack. Um, it's compatible with the Amazon S3 API, but it's strong consistent. Um, and so it scales linearly. I think this, this has like, um, about 600 12 terabyte helium drives, so it's peta petabytes per rack. Um, and it's S3 compatible, so it ties in natively with the S3A connector. And so why, are, why didn't we stop after our S3A contributions? Why do we still want to do this HDFS provided thing? Exactly because S3A doesn't fit all the use cases. We have happy customers using it. It fits their workload. It fits their use case. That's great. Um, Definitely tomorrow, come to Steve Lochren's talk. Uh, put is the new rename because S3, a, S3 is not a file system. So directories, um, some applications just don't work. Append is not supported. Um, data locality, I think Sanjay was at the end of his talk this morning very vivid about um, data locality. Vendors say it's not important. I think it's um, when it's important, it's extremely important. Um, and for some workflows, in, I agree that it's not that important, but when it's important, it's extremely important. Like your, your LAP, hot stuff, you don't want to get it from, from an external tier. So, um, and then another very important part, when we're talking to customers, they had all these existing HDFS workflows. Their admins um, had set up an entire ecosystem around it, and th the, those also quite break down when they, when they start using S3A. So for these use cases, um, we wanted to integrate better with HDFS, and then 
once we, we got in touch with the guys at Microsoft, we, we saw that we actually both wanted to, to accomplish the same goals. So have data locality for your hot data, but store the cold data in an object store um, while keeping the familiar HDFS abstractions. So encryption, security, admin tooling, that all keeps working. So recap, um, application just um, ma writes to the to HDFS, as it has always done, and it's HDFS which manages the remote store. Go ahead, just skip through. So, um, so you, you mount the remote store as a provided tier in HDFS. Um, you will talk about the details. You set the storage policy that was in the demo. Um, so basically, you have this remote namespace. It can be another HDFS system. It can be an Hadoop, um, an S3 bucket or an Azure bucket. You have your HDFS namespace. You mount, you mount in this bucket. You mount it at slash C. Um, and then I think last year's talk was about the alias map how we need to preserve a mapping between the remote location and uh, the HDFS block. Um, so we think this, this allows, this offers you the best of both worlds. Um, you have HDFS for your streaming workloads, your hot workloads, data locality, and you have your object store for um, your resilient scale-out storage. Um, and it's also a very good way to do HDFS to HDFS uh, migrations. Uh, we often get the question representing this, what about, isn't this Aluxio, isn't this um, these caching solutions? Um, so this could be used for as a caching solution, so your HDFS copy, you keep it in a hot tier. Um, I think RAM or SSD, probably SSD, you keep it there and you keep one copy outside and you can drop the hot cache as needed. Um, I think the big difference is here that, that Aluxio sits in between the compute and HDFS, and also then in front of the cloud stores, which is like it horizontally abstracts away all the different storage systems you have in your environment, where we think more of a vertical thing. You have your compute, it, it keeps on talking to HDFS, there's no change for your applications, and then vertically, this is not caching, it's like a tiering solution with an optional cache. cache. Um, so we don't see, we don't want to tie together 100 different storage systems in a, in a, common, sh in a common layer because what's still left in, in, in the middle here, we really believe that HDFS is your Hadoop file system and this is your, um, your object store, which, which is your data lake or whatever fancy term they, they use for it. So I think crucial here is that, that we preserve the, the file object mapping. So a file in HFS needs to be an object in the object store. You don't want to see block 17 and some blocks in your, in your object store. There's no value to that. So there is this alias map, which was last year's talk, which just preserves um, every block ha is a region in an object. And with ranged reads, you can then get that data. Um, and so multiple data nodes collaborate to move blocks which form a file to move them as a whole to form an object in the object store or to form a file in the remote HDFS. Um, doing this movement, we want to do that as efficient as possible. Um, so you don't want to reconstruct all the files inside your HDFS cluster and then move them, move them in bulk. You can have uh, efficient um, transfer. It's this, the same story as S3 A renames. If you want to do efficiently, multi-part is this abstraction which the which the object stores give you um, to do this kind of thing. So on S3, it's multi-part upload. WASB has a similar thing, blobs to which you can append. And on the remote HDFS, you would um, write, write the files as blocks. For every block, you write a file in a, in a temp dir, and in the end, you concat the files together to, to recreate the original file. Um, so deployment-wise, there really is, um, there are two options. So either you run in the name node because it's easy to deploy for the larger um, folks, the folks, folks with larger clusters out there, there is so much name node pressure already. Um, they want to move it in, into an external service. So, as we did before for the alias map, and as you, um, there's a related project here which you and will talk about the storage policy satisfier. There also there was pressure to to move it also optionally outside of the name node, and here we do the same thing. Um, so because there is some similarity with the SPS, we would like to reuse. Um, their protocols once, once they get merged. 
Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about the technical details now that hopefully you see the why. I'm going to explain the how. So we begin with um, the, the basics is that the applications will write to HDFS, and this part going to your um, standard replication shouldn't change, except in the basic case, you'll also have a provided tier as well. So what happens is you write your file, and then your blocks are in your data nodes. Then asynchronously, the name node um, for each file would do this uh, multi-part init, uh, doing the metadata operation. So in the case of uh, writing a file, it will do a multi-part init. Each of the data nodes would do their multi-part puts. And then the name node, again, after some discussion over the heartbeat, the name node is made aware that the replicas have been uh, written out to the external store. It doesn't uh, let the data nodes delete them yet because uh, if there's a problem at this point, then you're going to lose data. So we have to have uh, special logic that understands that the data has been stored in the external store uh, until the multipart complete is done. They're not actually done. So the multipart complete is done. And at that point, extraneous blocks could be removed. So for instance, if you did have a storage policy of uh, one disk copy and then provided, uh, you would still want your local replication to have resilience during the period between writing uh, and, the, and when the asynchronous process actually sees the new data and is able to write it, you still need that resilience. So the major components on how this works in the name node are, first off, we have this uh, amount manager, which has the information um, about where in the file system tree this is. Uh, the information is then also uh, it's stored in extended attributes, so it's automatically locked and uh, written out to the FS image and edit logs. This information is then used by the what's called the sync service satisfier. This is a, a it can be a thread inside the name node, as Thomas had described, or it could be part of an external service. And this will ask the mount manager to make a snapshot of the mount manager uh, of the mount location, and then take it can take a snapshot diff of two states in time. Using that information, it's passed to the phased plan factory, uh, which will then create the work that needs to happen in the correct order, uh, which is non-trivial, and I'm going to explain a bit about that in a moment as well. Finally, once we have the plan of work that needs to happen in the order that it needs to happen, we submit the work. Uh, the metadata operations are all run from the uh, name node or from uh, either that or the sync service satisfier, uh, and the uh, data operations that involve blocks are written are done from the various uh, data nodes, <coughs> and that's uh, that's tracked. This is generally how the components hook together. So we have the mount manager talking to the sync service satisfier. Sync service satisfier is continually doing snapshot diff reports, not continuously but periodically, when uh, and then the it submits the work to the phase plan factory and then to the uh, sync task tracker, right? So the first part of this, so the sync service satisfier is sitting on the snapshot diff report. So I'm not going to go into how uh, that works. Um, that's a that's a fairly in the interest of time. Yeah, in the well, in the interest of time. <laughs> um, but I'm going to talk about how the um, a bit about how the phased plan. Uh, factory work, so the, how, how the plan is generated. So if you have a snapshot diff report, it tells you there's new files, there's renamed files, there's deleted files, there's uh, modified files and directory, and the same for directories. So it would make sense that you could just take the work and say create, or do all the deletes first, then do all your directory creations, then write all the data. And in the simple case, this really, this, this works fine because you just, for instance, in this case, we just if we have a basic test and we create a directory inside of there, and then we create some files, then the snapshot diff report um, will just tell us add some files. But there's some really tricky bits in here. For example, between two snapshots, what if you swap two files around? Well, you can't just 
have a rename from file A to B or from B to A because obviously if the order of the operate there's no order of operations we need to invent work because we need to uh, invent this uh, attempt file that would need to be created so uh, this is also the case for arbitrary rings so you could rename around a ring and you'd have to figure out how how that works if you do this in the naive uh, directed graph sense of how the work would be done. Thankfully, the distcp sync exists and has some code that does something similar uh, to the point that I'd like to pull some of this code into HDFS to reuse and then we could uh, reduce on some code if possible. And the way that this is done is it uh, we, we make all renames go to a temp directory or a temp file uh, and then after that, the renames uh, are done to a, uh, their final location. And strangely enough, the way that the DCP sync works is that it, it just ignores the, the deletes. They are moved to a temp location and then they're dropped when the temp directory is dropped. And then what happens is we uh, do perform the creates and modifies. So it's, it's actually, in the end, uh, quite a simple algorithm that is very, uh, generalizes very well. So in our, our case, we, we do almost the same thing. We, we rewrite the target destinations, uh, we rename uh, the files to a temp directory, um, then we delete, we perform our deletes to the back ends, um, we perform the, the renames, and then uh, do the creates after that. So, okay. So in the, in the case before, what would happen is uh, instead of just doing the swap, you know, of course, these just get uh, written to the temp locations. So the next part to talk about is the sync task tracker, which um, as you saw in the uh, animation before, we have a multi-part put, or multi-part init, multi-part puts, and multi-part complete. But it's also possible to use the system with HDFS on top of HDFS. Um, which is actually an interesting use case, um, which uh, micro our colleagues at Microsoft have been exploring. But HDFS doesn't have a multi-part um, upload system at all. Uh, distri the, the distributed file system of HDFS doesn't support it. So we propose to introduce a multi-part uploader, which is generic over all uh, of the file system types, which you could support it for. So in this case, uh, we would have a, an init multi-part and a put part and a complete. So the, the, the way that um, if you used S3 before, you'd be familiar with this and same with WASP. Um, and then the way that this would work in HDFS is we, um, the init would create a temporary directory, the put parts write to that temporary directory, and then the complete uses concat and uh, pushes the, the data into the correct uh, location. Um, so this is nice because you get your file isolation, so you don't get to have dirty reads of data that's not done yet. And the approach that we use using these upload handles and part handles, these are basically um, non-typed payloads that can be sent over the network, and this means that the multi-part uploader can exist in, for instance, Hadoop Common, uh, and HDFS can implement it, and the name node can manage work for the S3 without having to understand the types and how to serialize and deserialize the different payloads coming from the system. So, all right. so how would this work in uh, all put together? So this is a sequence diagram where you have your name node is performing the uh, multi-part put going to the uh, multi-part uploader, which is then forwarded to the external endpoint. Um, then you get the response, which is wrapped in the upload handle. Uh, then using the heartbeat mechanism, uh, we do our multi-part pots in parallel. Uh, so this way we don't need to copy the blocks between all the data nodes, and they can all act completely in parallel. Then uh, when all of it is done and the tracker is satisfied that all the data has been uploaded, it collects all the, the part handles, and it uses that with the upload handle to complete the the work, so this would work for HDFS and it works for S3. And if I speak more quickly, it's because we're running lower on time. So, 
So as, Tom, as Thomas had mentioned, uh, all this requires a synchronization um, point. And uh, originally, we had designed to have something in uh, what's called a coordinating data node, uh, which is similar to what the, um, the SPS, the storage policy satisfier, proposed. And, and it was recommended that they move all of their synchronization to the name node. And so we're following suits to do this as well. And of course, for very bu busy systems with very large clusters, uh, this is going to add a lot of pressure on the name node. So we're also planning to have it optionally externalized. Uh, and this is similar to the alias map and the, st the storage policy satisfier. So that is the talk. Uh, if you want to follow the ticket, 12090 on the HDFS JIRA. Um, lots of uh, tickets. And we've been, as I said, we've been working with uh, Chris Douglas and Virjeth Jalparti at uh, Microsoft. And uh, a lot of people have been reviewing patches and making comments. So I'd just like to thank everyone, uh, even if they couldn't make it, because um, it's a uh, team effort. I think we have time for a couple of questions. There were two here in the front before. Were they answered or are they still valid? And then we have a third one over there. The, the sync service does the movement. The admin so can... Uh, repeat the question, please. Yeah, sorry. So the, the question is, why, why does, does the admin need to set the storage policy? Set a storage policy? Why doesn't the sync service do that? Um, the admin can decide whether this data is cold or not. When he tears it, does he want to keep one in-cluster SSD copy and have one copy outside, or, or just one copy outside, or not have? So within this mount, not all the files need to be synced. You can still optionally um, decide that through the storage policies. And in eventually, you could maybe even have scripts which look at um, modified f time or, f or access time, etc to gradually move stuff out. Sanjay, you have a question? Yeah, so originally when we were dealing with the um, question, I'm sorry, oh, sorry, to repeat the question. So uh, the question is, um, all other storage tiers uh, re re require no interaction from the name node, no input from the name node, and it's up to the date node to, to perform, to just do this. Um, and so why, has why with this system have we decided to do this? Um, I'd say first, um, the storage policy is managed from the name node, so the knowledge. So it's not like the data node, which currently has no knowledge of blocks. It treats blocks as completely independent, um, and and no knowledge that oh, these actually sum up to files. The 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 name node was uh, was aware of the different storage types, and so it, so it knows about them. It sets them. It tells the data node where it even suggests which storage type, which storage, which storage system to use, it, the data node then ignores it. It says like, uh, I know you have five hard drives, I want you to put it on the third one. And the data node ignores that with the volume chooser versus the placement policy. So we, I, I, I didn't realize maybe that it was so, like a hard requirement that we wanted to keep, the, the keep it that way. Uh, and and the No, no. So you the, the, the question, the question is: If you look at S three, will you see files? Or will you see blocks? And the absolutely hard requirement for us, 
is the C files. If you, if you have an ephemeral HDFS cluster, you want it to be able to go away, and then you want your object structure, your object file structure. Yeah. And that's the name node has the namespace. I think that gentleman was first, I guess. So there are multiple reasons. There was one slide on that. So why, um, why don't, why do I still need HFS? Why can't I directly talk to S3A? You can, but for for quite for some use cases that doesn't work. For instance, if you want to run age-based, or if you have if you have very um, high-performance um, applications which which actually require data locality. So the S3A is really remote storage. This is like an intermediate step where you first communicate with HCFS, probably using a very fast tier, like yeah. an SSD tier, and then asynchronously, um, the data gets steered out to your object store. So your object store is eventually consistent with your HCFS cluster, but your applications interact with HCFS, so your applications don't need to change, all applications work, and all existing HCFS workflows work, like the admin tooling we, I mentioned, encryption, Kerberos, people, People who have large existing HDFS deployments really have invested a lot in that, and those are the ones which, when we approached them with S3A, they told, now we, we want to keep our HDFS uh, tooling workflows. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So the yeah. So to uh, obviously, when you write data from Spark or actually from MapReduce, you write to a temporary directory, and then when the job the task has been completed, you you move it into its final location. Uh, yeah, uh, we added a filter. Um, in it, uh, it's an interface. It's we have an implementation based on a regex. So anything that's underscore copying underscore or anything that's underscore temporary is just we don't do it because it's pointless because it's going to cause thrashing on the system. So when the question is when was this, will this be available in mainline Hadoop? So reading is already there. Uh, it was merged in December, HEFS 9806. Um, the part we presented today, um, we're mainly still waiting for the SPS to merge to then be able to reuse their workflows. Um, but on our side, most is coded up. Hadoop 3.1, yeah. Yeah, yeah but this, that was the read part. Be, being able to, you have a block in S3, it's, there's no physical copy of that data anymore in, um, in your um, HEFS cluster, and you can still transparently, the, through the data node, read, the data node reads from S3 and serves that to your uh, HEFS client. That's what we presented last year. Uh, here and by now it got merged. I, th I think yeah. We're, if there are more questions, we're, we're sticking around here um, for the the bird of feathers for HCFS. So if there are more questions, uh, come and find us. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>